Well, welcome home, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this lecture. Uh, just to get a little bit of background about myself, my name is Andrea. I'm a spiritual seeker of truth, and I'm so happy to have all of you join us here today. I know you're all spiritual seekers of truth, and it's great to have you join. We're also really grateful to have Fujiko Science here today um, teach people how they can come home in a spiritual sense and to learn that for herself. Um, and I'm very excited personally to have Fujiko here because I attended one of her lectures when she was lecturing in Berkeley and it was just such an amazing experience. I know at first I was a little bit indecisive about whether to, whether to come or not and then I decided to join and it was just a beautiful spiritual ex experience. I, I went there and there's just so much light shining through Fujiko. She's such a beautiful idea, beautiful expression of love and just really grateful that she can join us here today and speak to us all. So with that, I'll hand it over to Fujiko. identity and her place and um, you know in the most of the real world teenagers don't get to run away from home they want to keep you there but in this story she takes up and I know it's a typical coming-of-age story that everyone probably experienced something like this I know if I asked you you probably have an adventurous and you know uh, stories that you can share but I don't think it really is just one time that when we leave home that we have this something called coming of age we continue to transform and go through this transition and the more we go through we think about something more spiritual the stability in our relationship you know meaningful work the more um, lasting health and I call it more of an adulthood to spiritual self. And I just want to read the, the verse that was supposed to be played. <laughs> um, I roughly translate it. It says, when I was little, there was God. And every day he delivered love to me. He made my dreams come true. I'm no longer a child, but still when I wake up enveloped in sweet kindness, the miracle can happen. When I'm enveloped in the soft fragrance of gardenia right after the rain, surely all things you see becomes a message. Well, the writer of this uh, the song, the verse, is not belonging to any particular religion. But this verse really reminds me of um, a child that's in this certainty that our children have that there's a dependable generous uh, power that only knows good about you and sends these messages to each one of us and the God mentioned here is not uh, a particular God of certain religion it's universal it's unconditional it's not the God that divides us but it really unites us. And this child that can really feel this kind of child, um, God is in every single one of us. And it's not like, sometimes we say we say childlike. It's different from childish, but it's childlike. I don't mean childlike. It's a child within you. And that's actually a, a powerful uh, identity that you already have that seems like we're living in the world that tries to suppress us. 
And I realized today that what's really important for a child is to have hope. And I know why you're in Burning Man, because this is your home. When you came in, you were greeted as welcome home, right? So every home has a child, and this is your home. And um, because my work is in talking with people and working through some challenges, a health problem, relationship problem, I really began to feel more and more that reviving this child is so important in our, in our lives. And that shift that we can make, not just because I'm, we are in the home called Burning Man, but when we return to our so-called practical real world, that we still have that child within us. And um, that is really an important tool for healing, transformation, uh, innovation, uh, bringing something new to a society that will unite us instead of dividing us. And I know that in, throughout the history, including myself coming from Japan, I study the um, healing of chi. And um, healing takes place in all different places and all different cultures. One thing that I notice it's the same is a shift in our consciousness. And I consider one master in this uh, part of the, the healing, uh, the master teacher to be Christ Jesus. You know, and most of us know Christ Jesus as a sing central figure for the religion called Christian Christianity, but was he Christian? No. <laughs> He's from the Jew Jewish background, right? And uh, it, amazingly enough, if you really pay attention to his words, not even once he says God in the terms that the Jewish people call God, like Elohim or Jehovah. It's always either our Father or Abba, like Daddy, or the Divine. His sense of God was so much broader and deeper. It doesn't belong to one religion. In fact, his mission was to really free us from that limitation that says you have to be certain that the society or the culture or the tradition tries to mold you into. And, you know, I escaped uh, Japan when I was 21 thinking that I wanted to be free from that tradition and custom. And then I realized the more I'm far away from home, so-called home, I think more about home. What is really home? It's amazing that uh, there are a couple of things that this master teacher said. Christ Jesus said, uh, to become a, like a child, as a child, to be able to experience the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is not somewhere that you go after you die, but he said, indeed, it's within you. Within you or is at hand. It's not somewhere out after so-called death. Another thing he said was to repent. And I didn't used to like this word repent because I felt like I haven't done anything wrong. What am I really being apologetic to, about? But repent really means to rethink. Pante is a, to think, right? And the Greek word that's used in the first recorded uh, the words of Jesus says metanoia. That means to think differently, to think from different perspective. So if he's saying to become like a child and to shift your thinking, and also, another thing he said was, you shall know the truth. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Not so-called institution or some kind of dogma or creed. It's something that's already within us. And I know the, uh, the class before me, there are lots of people tapping them, you know, like tapping for healing, and they have all these little uh, acupoints that they were tapping. And I thought, you know what we really, need to tap into is who we truly are and the his teaching is really simple profound but it's universal I don't regard his teaching to belong to a certain small group of people especially at certain time of the history so it's for everyone and you will know that's for everyone because as I have experienced I have a Buddhist friend in Osaka Japan who had uh, contracted uh, hepatitis C, and he was always seeking. He was being told that at the end of his life, he will have a 
failing liver and have liver cancer and basically die from the cancer. But as he was searching, he found this book called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Because he read so many different books, he thought, well, there is something for me here. And one time he committed, I'm going to spend next three months, whether or not I understand that there's a translation of, of this book. Uh, this is written by an American woman called Mary Baker Eddy, who lived most of the 19th century, who rebelled this idea that somehow this teaching of the healing works that Christ Jesus gave belonged to only a small portion of people. And somehow we're, the rest of us are damned if we don't really regard him as a savior. He never said, look to me for salvation. He says, even if you don't believe me, believe the works that I do. And if you do, believe your father. And so that whole idea of child, this book is trying to explain that where we come from, what our true origin is, and what really makes us. Is it this stuff, or is it something that's called spiritual substance that we may not be able to grasp all of it, but we can begin to see more of it. Anyway, thankfully the study of um, his teaching is now available in this book called Science and Health with Key to Scriptures. I believe the group that's supporting this talk has free copies to take home. I'll be uh, um, uh, um, quoting from this book. But anyway, what happened to Mr. Takemura in Osaka was one day he was walking a dog and walking towards east, you know, the sunset, sun setting on the west, so it's really getting dark. But for a, a moment, he felt that his body was really lighter and even the surroundings started to be bright. And he thought, that's really strange because I'm walking east and it really should be dark. And he felt something's taking place now. Maybe it's the healing that this book is describing. But he was not strong because the doctor said you will never be healed of uh, hepatitis C. A few months later, you w he went back to have a checkup. There was no sign of hepatitis C. And he said, what happened? He said, I may be the one that, as this book describes and the Bible describes, that I am a child of God. The child of God as a child of love, divine love. And love, of course, we talk about love. Not the love that divides us, not the love that comes and goes, but love that is unconditional, universal, and unifying. It's the power. It's not emotion, but it's a power that everyone has within us because we come from love. Anyway, so recently he said, you know, I have been healed of this. Um, 2010, it's been now six years since he had this healing, it's on his own. His son was diagnosed with uh, cancer in pancreas. And he called me and said, I really want my son to live, not to succumb to this diagnosis that says he has pancreas and there is no nothing but this very aggressive treatment. And he said, how do I pray? And we talk about this, and the very moment that what the thought came to me was, to see his son as a child. Not Mr. Takemura's child, but as a child of this divine love. And if he's coming from that love, there is no, not a single element that will that may be able to develop into something we call cancer. A cancer, suddenly, he just started to see that it's something that is removable, it dissolves, it will be nothing if he can really concentrate to see him. But this son at that moment was a very angry person, so every time he saw his father, he was you know, yelling at him and very abusive of uh, his own parents. And it was a, a lot of chore for him to be able to see that he is really coming from this love. So one night he was sitting there, concentrating on trying to see him as a, an idea or a child of God. And he said it was uh, maybe two in the morning, suddenly, instead of trying to feel that this son has something that's uh, 
horrible that he needs to remove. He felt that that same light that enveloped him earlier when he experienced that healing of hepatitis C, he felt within himself and said, I was so grateful that I have this truth and not me, but the truth is healing the sun. Well, but we, you know, we haven't even told the son that his father started to pray for, for him. But the next checkup showed that four centimeter diameter ca cancer completely was gone. It was the two uh, most cutting edge machines that the Japanese medical, you know, the field has. And it's never a mistaken image that they had before but it's definitely changed. And an interesting thing is a son had confessed uh, almost six months later that I actually felt something leaving me. Something changed within me. And that's the shift in consciousness that I am talking about. He became a child. In fact, more than what disappeared from his pancreas, more importantly, his character had completely changed. And because they're Buddhists, they went to the Buddhist temple and asked the priest, what about, you know, how would you explain this in Buddhism? You know, the, the, the priest said, he just took a moment, closed his eyes and said, son, you died once, was born again. You're a new person. That language, you know, coming from a Buddhist priest to me coincide with what we read often in the Bible that you're born again and again transformed to really see who you are you know and I had mentioned prayer but it really reminds me that when we are in Japan around third grade we we learn uh, calligraphy and the way we learn is that since this uh, calligraphy, the ink is permanent ink, uh, it's a really big deal for us to be able to uh, sit with this ink, the beautiful, what you call rice paper, it's not really made out of rice, but uh, a handmade paper, and the teacher will always give you the model character, and we have to put it right next to the, the white paper, the blank paper, and the teacher says, keep your eyes on the model. Keep your eyes on the perfect character as you move your hand. And the temptation is for us to continue to check how we're doing in comparison to the perfect model. But the teacher will say, no, don't look at your character or the, your hand. And I just thought when I started to learn what prayer is in Christian science, it's exactly that. If we have that perfect model that we come from that divine love that with this consciousness of only knowing good about you and maintaining that message is continuously that's the only thing that you need to focus on and the rest of things if it needs to be uh, stripped away it will it's just like you know our group is washing our feet in our camp truth life and love camp and we have to use a vinegar, a diluted vinegar, to take the playa uh, dust, right? Or dust or sand. And it's not like we have to really scrub it. As soon as we put the little drop of the diluted vinegar, it washes away. That's what the truth does. It's not whether you're worthy of it, whether you have studied this for a long time, but it is just to know that there is already truth within yourself and within this universe. We already live in that divine love's universe. And it's not far away. It's close at hand. It's available to anyone who is either believing in the divine or having a different religion or perhaps being very hateful that, like Mr. Takemura's son. It didn't matter if that person who is praying for that that patient, so-called patient, has that single view. And I want to talk about this single view because I think children have this single, almost like a tunnel vision. And one of the things that I love about children, 
is that they can concentrate on one thing forever. I don't know, around here it's hard to do it, but you know, by the beach they built the sand castle. You know how they're so focused. And when the wind comes, and when the, when the wave comes, and washes the castle away, do they cry? Have you seen them in this? They laugh. They get to build it again. There's no resentment like, how dare you wave, you come and destroy my beautiful structure. They're not doing to take something to permanently keep it there. The very moment that there is, they are right there at the beach doing it is when they are the happiest. And that's what I call living now. And I see, I see the people here at night and the day, they're living now. And they're happiest, their child. And then when they go back to work, they're not living now. They're thinking, I want to get out of this office. <laughs> they're rarely in the very moment. And you know, people like Einstein who said, there is, there is, uh, actually, I wrote it down so I won't misquote him. He says, um, uh, all that ever has been or ever shall be is in the now. That's the infinite. And this woman who wrote this book, Mary Baker Eddy, in the, very, the preface, the very first line, she says, to those leaning on the sustaining infinite, today is big with blessings. That infinite is now. Not dragging the past, future, or fear, resentment, but just staying now. For example, um, you know, we can do a little practice and see this very moment be in the now. Got it? Clean slate. You don't bring any history of your own self or others and that now is an amazing word because when I did some research on what the words of Jesus when he said before you pray he says walk into the closet in the Hebrew dictionary the cousin word that's for that for the closet is present now he's saying there's the only way to be connected with the divine is now. And everyone who is very childlike, you know, uh, not just childlike, but a child. I would say Einstein was very uh, much a child. Have you read about him or saw his picture? You know, the, the famous picture that he's, he's sticking his tongue and you know, having fun. Sometimes he's with children. Um, people like Mozart, if you know that people have done something that we still continue to enjoy listening to or reading. Socrates, he is known for what? <laughs> Being a great philosopher, but I don't think he himself was thinking, I'm going to be a great philosopher. He was known as not having much of a sustenance every day, you know, bread and water, basically. And his wife is known as the, the three worst wives in the world in our history. Did you know that? No? The three worst wives I'll, I'll, I'll just share with you. One is wife of Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, that's probably not fair always. Another one is Tolstoy's wife, Sophie. And the third one was Socrates' wife. She used to hit him. You know why? Because he is in trance, being able to hear voices. And he was so, like a, much like a child. But for other people, when they say, well, you have to work from eight to five, and this is the way you have to dress, this is the way you have to think, these people look like a little crazy people. And no wonder these wives felt a little, you know, unfair to be married to these guys. But the focus is always being beyond themselves. I think it's very important to know that the children, until they were taught about being self-centered, they don't really have that self that needs to be constantly pleased. You know, um, 
my younger sister who took my two daughters when they were little to uh, uh, one, she wanted to take them to a very nice restaurant and she brought beautiful dresses from Japan and put little you know nice uh, tights and they didn't really like it but you know auntie's really always nice so they listen and when she, when she asked them where would you like to go for dinner because she was thinking I'm going to teach them how to use the cutlery, you know, like how to use a spoon and fork and knife. And what they said was, and the Kiko, we want to go to <laughs> McDonald's. And they didn't dare not say McDonald's because at that time I was like, McDonald's the last place I take unless it was a uh, birthday or something, a special occasion. So they were going to her. <laughs> so my sister was a little bit disappointed, but you know, she's okay. That if that's the place that you want to go, they put a ribbon on and beautiful shoes, and they went to McDonald's, and uh, you know they got their food and sat down. And as soon as they sat down, my sister looked up and saw this one man coming in in the pushing the wheelchair with a, a heavily handicapped person in, it. and her heart sank because she said, "I oh, I wish they don't sit next to us." She was suddenly afraid that what if the girls, one of the girls say, I'm afraid of him. You know, he had some, some tubes and he didn't really look like he was that well. And then another thought that came was, what if they say, what's wrong with him? And so, when you wish something like that, you know what happens? They bring right next to you. <laughs> and so my sister's was thinking all this in split seconds. It's amazing how many thoughts can come in. And as soon as the gentleman who was uh, helping parked him and went to get his, their food, the girls were up straight to the man in the wheelchair talking, laughing. They didn't see him as a handicapped person lacking something that we needed to be fearful of Oh, we needed to be pitiful, but as a whole person, a beautiful idea. So when my sister came back from uh, from the uh, the dinner, she usually reports what happened. And when it came to this portion, she said, with tears in her eyes, I am ashamed to say this, but this is what happened. I didn't see what the children saw. So I just paused and I thought maybe we used to see that way. Otherwise you wouldn't be, be crying like that. You remember how it was like to see other people like that. Clean slate. You know, the whole idea that we somehow come from imperfection that doesn't make sense when we feel deep in our heart as children that this world is so beautiful that people, when we are exchanging things here in a Burning Man, it's unconditional. And how could we come from imperfection when we say God is perfect? So there must be this unmistaken theology or the idea that somehow we need to reinvent man. We all, we need to see is that we have the perfect beginning and the child that we have within us already knows and feels and the more people are going to start coming to Burning Man because this is where they feel it's okay to be a child and I'm sure a lot of healing takes place here because we are not putting people in the categories and I hope that's something that's happening right this moment that Master teacher who said, I and my father are one in nature. He didn't say, I am God. He said, I am in nature exactly the same. And May Baker Eddy gives this beautiful description that I love. She says, As a drop of water is one with the ocean, a ray of light one with the sun. Even so, God and man, father and son, are one in being. It's not a separate 
somehow detached, needing to come back all the way home. We have home within us. And we say, as a drop of water, one with the ocean. Think about the ocean, or maybe a sand in this whole playa, one with the whole playa. In case of the ocean, it's impossible for any of us to grasp the whole nature and the depths, the the nature and what's going on in the ocean at once. But we know a few things about the ocean. Tell me what you know about ocean. Anything? Big? Wet. Wet. Anywhere you go, it's wet. Okay, if I, yes? Water came from asteroids. The water came from asteroids? Is that right? Okay, so what does it taste like? Salty, right? Is it the same, the, the water that I taste in Tokyo Bay, same as San Francisco Bay? The saltiness should be the same ratio, right? So we know that, we also know that if it's built right, things float in the ocean. Even a huge tanker to my children's little toy, toy boat. And I only know two things, but I know because people have dried the ocean water and made salt, the way we live have changed, it's transformed. The way we preserve things, the, the culture or the tradition have changed because of salt. Some of the rituals also came you know, using these salts. Another thing is that because we know that things will float, people have traveled long ways and carried, transported things that we will never imagine that we will have here. The old world didn't have these tomatoes and tobacco. The new world had it and then they shipped it, right? In a volume. All I need to know is one or two things about this vast thing called ocean and you benefit. And I feel the same thing about the divine. No one can draw a complete picture about where we come from because it's the infinite. If we grasp it and someone say, yes, I understand, and it's in this dogma, it's in this theory, we already lost it. But if we have the knowledge of one or two things about that divine, then we can be healed. The most important thing, whatever the color of your skin or your language that you speak, if we know that you come from this one divine love, just know that you bypass your parents, your ancestors. There are no grandchildren or great-grandchildren in this divine love's family. You come directly from that. So you, no one in between to block it either. And as the, the song was saying, the message that comes, it comes in all different languages, but it also comes in the shift in our consciousness when we feel very free, when we feel like we just came out from the dark and see a little bit more light about someone else. I think, including myself, I don't think any of us is free of prejudice. We have some kind of prejudice, one way or another. And I'm really surprised every time I'm, uh, I'm made to learn that, wow, this person is another beautiful child of God. And if you don't want to heal others, love has to be there. One thing about children that I learned from my little ones is that they're quick to forgive, or maybe they don't have the grudges or resentment from the beginning. But the way they forget very quickly is just amazing. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, I think you can 
still hear me. One thing that will help us um, watch our thoughts. You hear she talks about everyone has a little door, that door of thought. It says stand quarter at the door of thought. Admitting only such conclusions as you wish realize in bodily results. You will control yourself harmoniously. So, I live in uh, uh, Pennsylvania right now in the, in the United States, and maybe you know a university called Penn State. And it's in a town called State College. We have lots of bars. And every bar has this uh, a person called a uh, uh, bouncer. The whole uh, ex-football uh, players or football player wannabe. They're just standing there checking your ID. And one time I thought, it's almost like we need to hire a bouncer at the door of our thought. And when he says, admit only such conclusions that you want in your community to realize, in your body to realize, in your family to realize. You have control of the dominion over your own body. So you're being, you hire this bouncer to say, yes, this thought in, no, this thought out. Even if it might be a diagnosis like the, uh, Mr. Takemura's son with pancreas cancer, he did not openly admit it said, okay, my son has a cancer, so this is going to be his life. No. He thought of what's the conclusion, the end product that he really wants to see first. We have to have that perfect model first in front of us. So, I'm not sure how long I've been talking about that. <laughs> I really feel that, that the child that can already accept that ability to keep looking at the model. And the model is not, somehow we had to draw, it's already given. That perfection is already given to us. Uh, one thing about that, standing at the corner of thought, uh, Dr. Eckert, you probably know him, he, he talks about this watching the, uh, your thought as if um, uh, cat is looking at the hole where the mouth is coming out so intently and if you have a habit of certain ways that you think about yourself I used to think like I was very careless because everybody said so I had so many accidents and I was called a child of accidents and somehow I accepted this and when I started to study this is the identity I really want to continue to have. Do I break so many uh, dishes because I'm careless? Is this part of me that I have to continue to carry, carry on? So I had to choose. And as soon as I decided, I don't have to be careless. That's an identity that somebody gave me. It's not true about myself. And you know, I used to think it's kind of funny because some of the, the personalities that we have might please other people. But we don't have to be a clown for other people either. We can really be sure to know that I am here to express the divine love that it's within me, but also other people see for me. So if I'm passing by and see my, my smile, that alone can actually heal. That divine love is not really, you know, contained within just one person. It really is everywhere. When you sweep your hand like this right now, can you do that? That's where divine love is. When you breathe in, that's your divine love. And if you're inhaling something good, only good can come out of that. You know, that's interesting how Jesus said, it's not something that you eat that really makes you impure. What comes out of your mouth is what really makes you impure. That's really part of our thinking, what we accept within ourselves. So, I want to talk about a couple of feelings that children have experienced. One is my my daughter's friend Michelle, when she was uh, in the uh, third or fourth grade, she had this terrible war, war 
on the bottom of them. And they were applying this uh, chemical to try to make it smaller and smaller. But you know, over three or four months, it just wouldn't work. It just keeps coming back. One time it grew so big, when she saw this board, showed this board to the mother, the mother said, oh, tomorrow we'll go to the doctor and cut it off. And you know, you can imagine the third grader told them, we're going to the doctor to cut my foot off. That's how she, she felt, you know. She was thinking like, of course, a little part of it, but she was so terrified. Going to bed, she was undercover, trying to remember what she was learning in Sunday school. Because she was often coming with my daughter, Saya, to learn about this true, complete, perfect child within us. And she just reached out from the bottom of her heart. She said, if it's not on God, this word is not on God, and it cannot be in me. You know, it seems silly, but the way she thought was, is this word on my original, you know, the, the creator? It's like, no. If it's a spiritual idea, how can you attach something to a spiritual idea? It's almost like the concept of zero. We're going to try to add a little number to it and make it something. Zero is zero. Spiritual idea is spiritual idea. I cannot, nothing can be added. Nothing that's already there that's good can be taken away. Next morning when she woke up, first thing she did was to check her, the bottom of her foot because she didn't want to go to the doctor to cut her whatever off. The work was not there. And I was not surprised to hear this because even as a child, I used to have work on my hand. And I had this very wise uh, helper in the, hand, in the house. She wasn't a Christian scientist, but you know one time she said, Fujiko, those words can disappear. Let's do this thing. And she gave me this little step of thing on the rice paper. We had a number of words that I had made a hole with uh, incense, the lit incense. And she said, we're going to the river, fold the paper up, pour a little bit of sake, and let it go on the river. And your work's gone. You know what happened? Next morning, I had no work. So when Michelle told me that this happened, I just thought a childlike trust that I had for my helper who said, let's do this. You don't have to have work. She didn't say, oh, it's too bad. You know, you have to do this and that. But it was an instant feeling like that I had from my childhood. It really made me think, if there is science to it, then I can really think that we can all learn. And what really science means, I'm sure there are some scientists here, originally the meaning of science is to understand, the knowledge to understand our universe. The knowledge to understand our universe. And the more we understand our identity, we will be free of material things out of us. I used to work for a semiconductor industry, manufacturing industry. And one time, the engineer told me, Fujiko, the more we understand the principles of what we're doing, less matter we need. Because in our 80s and 90s, what we're doing was to make things thinner, lighter, smaller. We have much less matter in your hand, your iPhone. iPhone has more computer computation capacity than what uh, was in Apollo 13. So when you think about it, if I am not well, and if I understand the principle of my being to be a child, that doesn't carry these elements to grow old or work uh, or, or uh, uh, somehow deteriorate or change into some other form. Less matter I need. I might still need few things. You know, she says, don't stop suddenly eating or sleeping. We still are here. You know, we're still on this plane. But we will need less and less matter.
and you think about the energy, when we think about Japan where we had a failing nuclear power plant, and we used to think, oh, oh little thing like this, that, that, uh, the nuclear substance, plus on you. We used to think that's a small matter, but look what happened now. We have a huge mess. It wasn't a small matter because we didn't understand the principle. And what I love to see is this. I know some of you have brought solar panels. What we need is already here. We don't need to destroy our environment. And I love this idea of what the father says to the prodigal son when he came back. Actually, the prodigal son's brother who said, I'm really jealous. You're treating you know, my brother after wasting all this uh, uh, time and money. You welcome him back with this huge party. And the father said to his brother, all that I have is thine, yours. It's not mine, yours, his. Everything is yours. Everything is yours. Everything that is here from that divine love is ours. So, and that Christian part, Mary Baker Eddy says, Christian is the highest form of man. The highest form that we can think with compassion. We can use less material things or violence to try to change our world. I'm wearing this longi. It's from Burma. The blouse is also from Burma, Amyama. I met uh, Asan Suchi uh, in the last couple of years twice. And uh, we had a nice an hour and a half meeting in her house. And one of the things that I really feel that I, I would like to share as part of this divine love is a power. And being a child is such a powerful tool. Is that when you see her, she is she has twinkling in her eyes. Never talks about how the military government had treated her wrongly or her colleagues wrongly. He, she's constantly living it now. She says, I have no time to look back. And she said, I have great respect for people who have non-violence movements. You know, starting with Gandhi, who was Hindi, but was so moved by the Sermon on the Mount, he said, I'm going to practice this. One time the journalist came to Gandhi and said, are you turning into Christian? And he said, no, I'm just practicing what Jesus had taught. I'm still a Hindi. And Asa Suchi says the same thing. I am a Buddhist, but I'm practicing this teaching, the non-violence. And he, she had to have every worker that went out with her when she had a campaign the sign, even if you're hit, even if you are thrown onto the ground, you're never going to return the same. No violence, Pack. they have the sign. And I met one, one close uh, a bodyguard, like a person, a man, he's still young. And that was a, so hard, after being beaten up, he lost his teeth, he actually cut his, uh, uh, broke his, his chin one time. He came back and the next time they were going out, she said, aren't you going to sign and come with me? And she says, I will be with you. Nothing can touch you. And even if the violence was taking place, when she was feeling that I don't need a bullet uh, vest, that divine love is protecting her. She knew this textbook, by the way, because she, when she was in Cambridge, she had a, a host family who studied this. And we talked about love, not human love. She said, we need to have compassion to act in kindness. The kindness comes from the divine love. The compassion is what Jesus had for people who had, you know, felt like they were lost. Compassion is to go into that person and feeling the same thing. He can really feel how it's like to be a leper. When he touched the leper, it was revolutionary because you're not supposed to touch them. Lepers were supposed to walk the very end of the street and say, lepers passing, lepers passing. He went to them and touched their field. That divine love 
which is the essence of the science and essence of your being. And the more we understand the principle of who we are, we need less matter. Einstein was another one who knew this book, you know, like Salinger, we have other people who have studied this, and he was amazed how Mary McGrady said, there is no matter in a way that you, you think that there's a solid something there. What quantum physics is proving now is not what we call the solid matter. And I know we sometimes call it even black matter. It's there, but we can't see. I think I want to end this talk with my uh, one of my favorite quotes. We love you! <laughs> anyway, so it goes, Emerge gently from matter into spirit. Think not to thwart the spiritual ultimate of all things, but come naturally into spirit through better health and moral and as a result of spiritual growth. You know, this really made me think of this image of a butterfly in the cocoon emerging so gently. It emerges without anyone pushing or pulling. It's natural to emerge from the present state to the next, more spiritual selfhood. So that's you. You're the butterfly. You're in the cocoon. Sometimes we're in the cocoon a little bit longer than we want to, but eventually you'll emerge. You'll emerge into a beautiful butterfly, a child of God. So thank you so much for being with me. And I'll stay here for any question and answer, or we can share some feelings that you have, or you know, maybe you have some something to add to this talk. So thank you. And at the very end, I think we like to take a little silent, uh, you know, like a moment, and then maybe Michael can play some beautiful music for us. Any questions? Okay, let's have a little quiet uh, moment, and then Mike, Michael, you can just break that. Okay.